Hello, everybody. Welcome to another uh, edition of Reader Meets Writer. I am back in my bunker here on the east coast of North Carolina. I was in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. I visited Malaprops, got three new books, my local bookstore in Asheville, North Carolina, where I am the writer in residence at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. But I am back now at home, unmasked, free, finally, and ready to spend time with you all. Uh, for another wonderful event. Um, this event is brought to you by the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And to tell you a little bit about that organization, it is known as SEBA, the acronym. Uh, SEBA represents just under 700 independent bookstores throughout the Southeast. So perhaps one of those bookstores invited you tonight. If you enjoy what you hear of and about Kim's book, Rules for Being Dead, please consider purchasing his book from the store that invited you tonight. Another little piece of information, uh, perhaps you'll have a question about the content of the book or the researching the book or some of the cultural references in the book. If you do have a question, go to the chat uh, button at the bottom of your little Zoom uh, screen there and, and type your question in. Make sure to mention your name and your home bookstore. And toward the end of the event, I'll ask him your question and I'll say your name and I'll give your bookstore a shout out because we want to let all of the bookstores um, out there that I've invited you, we want their names to be said want to hear them represented. Um, so again, welcome. And I will get right to this evening's event. But before I do, I want to remind everybody, Thursday night at 7, we have National Book Award winner Sarah Broom. She is going to join us in conversation and um, discuss her wonderful nonfiction book, The Yellow House, set in New Orleans, about the, uh, the legacy of property ownership in, in, in African-American uh, New Orleans uh, in the in post pre and post Katrina. So please join us for that Thursday night at 7 p.m., the same bookstore that invited you tonight, make sure they invite you Thursday night as well. But today we have two wonderful authors. Um, our first is gonna be our future author, it's Kim Powers, and he will be discussing his new book, Rules for Being Dead. He's also the author of Dig Two Graves, Capote in Kansas, A Ghost Story, and the critically acclaimed memoir, The History of Swimming, which was both a Barnes and Noble Discover selection and a Lambda Literary Award finalist for best memoir of the year. And we've had several authors um, who have joined us who have had careers other than traditional writing. And Kim is definitely one of those writers. So I hope that tonight he'll talk a little bit about that. He's worked at ABC News for the past 23 years. He's currently a senior writer for the iconic news magazine 2020. They've received three, uh, three consecutive Edward R. Murrow Awards. He's also received two Emmys for his work on Good Morning America and 2020. In 2007, he was selected as one of the Out 100, Out Magazine's top 100 most influential LGBT community members in the country. He's a native Texan. He's got an MFA from the Yale School of Drama. He was managing director of the theater magazine there. Um, he lives in New York City, Nasbury Park, New Jersey, and is married to the Tony Award winning costume designer, Jess Goldstein. So incredibly interesting. And he is going to be in conversation with another author that you all probably know. Uh, Lewis Byard's acclaimed historical novels include the national bestseller Courting Mr. Lincoln and Roosevelt's Beast, The School of Night, The Black Tower, The Pale Blue Eye, and Mr. Timothy, as well as the highly praised young adult novel Lucky Strikes. His, his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and Salon. He is an instructor at George Washington University, and he is a board member uh, with the Penn Faulkner Foundation. And he is really well known as the author of the popular Downtown Abbey recaps for the New York Times. So gentlemen, thank you both so much for being with us, and please take it away. Hey, Wiley, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Wiley. A flashback episode of This Is Your Life, uh, especially when it sounded like you said the Yale School of Trauma, which it com completely was. And, and senior writer should be more senior citizen writer. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, oh my gosh. Well, thank you. And thank you, Wiley, as well. And thank you to the indie bookstores out there for, for supporting uh, authors like us. Um, you, you are kind of the conscience of our nation and the last home of unredacted truth. So thank you guys for being out there. Yeah. Um, uh, I just, I'm, I'm fascinated. You were, I was in the out 100 one year too, and all I got from it was a, a crappy party with warm vodka. What did you, what did you get from it? I got the same crappy vodka, uh, well, the same crappy vodka, <laughs> but I'm pretty much used to crappy vodka, so it was fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I, I think I got one free uh, drink ticket and and like five free um, five free copies of the uh, of the magazine or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, I think something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, it was a great honor. It, it was a great honor, was and great honor. Uh, was great honor. Uh, I got I got uh, hair and makeup, which made me feel good for you know. Oh, that's um, right. For, for the, the picture the for the photo shoot. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. But, um, uh, <laughs> so until yesterday, we'd never actually met, uh, at least not in traditional terms, but in the strange, spurious way of social media now, COVID era intimacy. It feels like we've known each other for a long time. How, how can this be? Well, we're, we're certainly Facebook buddies. And yes. I have a story that I don't know if you even know. And I've been racking my brain to find out if I knew, knew about you right before this event I'm about to describe, or if I discovered you at this event. <laughs> but it completely links back to the beginning of my, my book writing career, which is that we shared an agent and did uh, and Christopher I, Christopher was my first agent and I know wow, he, I didn't know this and uh, at the very and he was representing my first book the history of swimming and I remember we were going out drink, drinking to celebrate you know sort of beginning this partnership and I think I was the one who did it. We were just like talking in general. And I started talking about, oh my God, there's this most incredible book I've just read. I just, I can't get over it. It's called Mr. Timothy. Oh. And he said, oh my God, that's my client. That's, you know. That's, <laughs> that's funny. That's oh, That's funny. And if you don't know this book, it is the most fascinating introduction to lose kind of, um, New work, not new world, because it's a few years old now, but sort of a reinvention of Lou as a writer. And it is the single most ingenious plot device I have ever heard of or read in my life. Mr. Timothy is Tiny Tim from A Christmas Carol, Grown Up. And Lou so perfectly captures this world of Victorian England and sort of, and, and it's been a while since I've even got a vi an audio visual. <laughs> oh, that's the hardback. This is oh, wow. serious. This is big bucks, man. I bought the hardcover. That's the OG, that's the OG, that's the OG book. Yeah. And, um, uh, well, he, I think he gets involved with solving the mis the murders of several prostitutes. Yeah, yeah, prostitute girl prostitutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, gosh, um, thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm supposed to be plugging your book, not not well, vice no, versa. I, so you you, let me, you let me just... are a star here much more than me, so I want to plug yours <laughs> and say. But the interesting well, you're thing, very kind. and there's you're very a segue kind. here. When I got to the end of Mr. Timothy, oh, okay. I was so shattered. I mean, really, it just a beautiful book. And I thought, this is a book, this is the most profound book about a son saying goodbye to his father that I have ever read. And I was, and I don't know you. I don't, I hope I'm not embarrassing you by saying that. I decided, not knowing you from a hill of beans, that that is why you wrote the book, that that was your goodbye to, to your father. Yeah, my father was dying as I wrote that book. And I was also becoming a father at the time, so it was a very yeah. intense moment. Uh, well, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and, Christopher and went on. Led, I, I, and then it led to. Would you shut this the fuck kind up, of new Kim? genre right. of writing, of finding these very particular little quirky historical moments that could be turned into mysteries. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and like, for example, say what the Pell Blue Eye was about. It's about um, Edgar Allan Poe at, at West Point, when he was yeah. a cadet at West Point, where he was actually a cadet for six months. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that our, our agent, is he's not currently your agent, I assume. He is not. Okay, no, so he went, on, he, he went on to marry Augustine Burroughs. So that is where he, he fetters his He did his marry Augustine Burroughs. Yes, yes, so. so he's doing fine. He's doing yeah. just fine. Um, oh, that's funny. I had no idea we had these connections. I had no idea. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when, bad vodka, um, sketchy agent, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, we, can, we can just, uh, I, I, I suppose we, if we just hung out the two of us, we could, we could discover any, any other. Oh, and your husband, um, your, I met your husband. He came yes. down, to, down to DC where I live and 
And my husband is tickets. a costume designer in theater yeah. and, and movies and opera. And one of his operas was in DC last uh, tro- uh, Actually, La it was the play. It was the, it was the Anne Richards play, actually. Oh, it was. was. That's right. It yeah. wasn't in the yeah. opera. It was, it was Anne, about Anne, yeah. the incredible Anne Richards that you went to see. Yeah. Yeah. So he had actually yes. met you before I got to. That's right. That's right. I know, in person. Which is yeah. so weird, right? Um, so let's now talk about your damn book, all right? Because that's what we're here for. Ache. Um, audio so, visuals. Audio visuals. Audio visuals. Yeah, I already did the. I already did the. Uh, did. The SCTV sort of three D three D book. Hold on. Right. Three D. Um, uh, th- so I've got to say. Authors today are encouraged to think of, of elevator speeches, but I, I don't know how you kind of put this into an elevator speech because it's got mystery, it's got thriller, it's got supernatural, it's got gay coming of age, and it's got memoir. It's it's like its very own subgenre. Uh, I've never qu- kind of come across a book quite like it. So. What do you have an elevator speech that you can give us for? for you know just- what? I, I, I developed an elevator speech along the way. And it's weird because I was so when I first started talking about the book, I was so kind of nervous to, to really sell it. I was sort of selling it as a murder mystery and which it is not. I mean, there is a, a possibility of a murder in it. And my my uh, my wonderful publisher and editor were saying, no, no, don't do that. That gives people the wrong idea. So I went through a lot of evolution before I I came to that. And I also re- realized that the way I pitched it, um, because there's sort of two primary characters in it, sort of dictated how you felt about it. So mm-hmm. sort of one version was it's about you know a young boy, ten years old, growing up and. Uh, tech, small town Texas in the mid 60s and his mother dies very unexpectedly very mysteriously and nobody will tell him how she died then the twist in it is nobody will tell her either the dead <laughs> mother is a character floating around in this sort of limbo land that's not heaven it's not hell and she can't go on until she knows what happened to her because the last few days of, of her life were very fuzzy as well. So she's she's not a ghost. She's not like, you don't hear organ music when she walks around. She's not covered in a white sheet. You know, there's not seaweed and, and water dripping off her. She's just, it's kind of now you see me, now you don't. And she's sort of invisible to her family members who were left behind. And she finds comfort in going back to the places in this small town that she loved in life. Like at the beginning of the book, she's perched in a tree house across from the street, where her, across from her house, and she's looking down and you see two EMTs coming out of the house with a body on a gurney, a body in a body bag. And somehow she knows that it's her body that's in that body bag. That's how it begins. And she sort of um, starts being able, she has this ability to, to say, move to the marquee at the top of the little movie theater in the town where they live. She can sort of go to the very top of the drive-in movie screen, which is like two, two stories above ground and perch there and sort of look 360 degrees around. She can even go to the, um, the classroom where the little boys are still in, in grade school and perch invisibly on top of the um, the flagpole that they have to stand up to and say the Pledge of Allegiance to. So she's desperate to not break that connection to them. She's desperate to look after them because she knows the, their father, the husband she left behind, is not really capable of taking care of them. So she, she, you know, it's almost like she's playing Nancy Drew, the little boy, which is essentially like little me, a fictional version of 10 year old me is playing Hardy Boys, just going along parallel paths, trying to find this mystery of how she died and what happened to her. Now that's a long elevator I was gonna say, that was not an elevator speech. That was like that's Uber stuck in downtown I traffic uh, speech. Story. Yeah, that was. Get what the book is about that <laughs> a little bit. Um, it is one of the fascinating things about the mother character is that, you know, you talk about the rules for being dead and she's still learning those rules pretty much through the, 
as a ghost, she's on the, she she's a little bit ineffectual. She can't remember how she died. Yeah. Um, she can't always intervene in the in her son's lives the way she would like to. She's still learning these rules as she goes along. Yet right. she can she can see forward some distance. Yeah. And it's just something I came up with. I want, uh, maybe it was a way to sort of in, inject some humor into it and to a little bit indicate, you know, what was going to happen to the boys when they grow up. But she's able to see the future. And um, she, but just like these little flashes, she doesn't quite know what she, she sees. So like she sees this movie called Mother, may I sleep with danger. She sees <laughs> named Tori Spelling. She, she, she sees Tori Spelling. She sees, she sees Tori Spelling. She sees, you know, something called Facebook. She sees things called emojis. She kind of comes up with her own acronym, which is, um, you know, instead of rolling on the ground laughing, rolling in my coffin laughing. <laughs> so it has this very dry, mordant humor where she's trying to sort of make peace with this bizarre world, you know, that she's, she's in. Because she sort of, sometimes at night, she kind of, you know, invisibly teleports to the cemetery where she's she's buried, and she walks around thinking that you know she was supposed to to follow through this tunnel of light and see her dead relatives. You know, somebody was supposed to greet her, and nobody's there. She's just as lonely in death as she was in life. Um, and I think I actually think the the rule for being dead she comes up with the most important one is like you need to know how you died. That's mm -hmm. what she wants to learn, you know. And, and yet, then, the interesting yeah. thing is this, is this is at some level a, a mystery story, and yet you don't ever give us a definitive solution about that. I don't, and it's, it's very interesting. And, and you mentioned memoir as sort of one of the elements in it, and I'll, I'll sort of pick up on that. Yeah, uh, it, it's definitely a work of fiction. It's a novel, but it picks up on some real things that happened in my family that it took me some 40, 45 years to learn. And that was, in fact, my mother did die very suddenly and very mysteriously when I was a kid, when I was nine, 10 years old. For the longest time, sadly, I thought that she had killed herself. Um, I had found her in an attempted suicide and, and had prevented an attempted suicide of hers, um, oh, maybe two months before she died. Uh, her head was covered in dry cleaner plastic with a belt around her neck. And I came in unexpectedly and found that and, and she sort of ripped the plastic off and said, oh, I'm just getting rid of a cold. Don't tell your father. So from then on, the sort of whispers in this small town were that she had in fact killed herself. And you know, all these sort of pill bottles, um, empty pill bottles were found on the bed, you know, uh, when she was found dead on April Fool's Day, as a matter of fact, which sort of led to the whole sort of macabre element of it. Um, when I, and I, but I was haunted as a kid by the fact that she didn't leave a suicide note. Why didn't she say goodbye? You know, if, if her children supposedly meant so much to her, why did she never say a final goodbye? Then when I was out of college, you know, uh, my older brother sprung this, you know, one, 180 on me, which was that he said, no, 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 that was just the story. What really happened is that your father, my, you know, my father, our father killed her and not just, you know, killed her emotionally or was a cold guy or whatever. He murdered her, stuffing pills down her throat so he could be with his new girlfriend. And in fact, the new girlfriend became my stepmother about six, seven months later. So that was a whole other revelation. Um, and, and then several other relatives started supporting that and started telling me little pieces, you know, just sort of memories that were now turning into clues and pieces of evidence to support the idea that he did in fact kill her. So then that was, you know, I, I write it, um, while you said, you know, I write it 2020 and we do true crime stories every week, mm -hmm. but I was living one. I felt like my life had become a true crime story. And then it wasn't until History of Swimming came out like 15 years or so ago that I got one of these kind of creepy emails out of the blue. And this is almost in the early days of email where like, is it real? Is it fake? Is it a fad? Is it gonna last, you know? And it just said, your mother. And it turned out to be from the woman who had been my mother's student teacher 
for all of three days. My mother was a fourth grade school teacher. My mother's teacher, a school a student teacher saying, oh my God, you, you never knew? You don't know what happened to your mother? She proceeded to tell me something that was so bizarre and so revolutionary and so different from these two other possibilities. But that in, a, in some way was sort of, they all came together to create this perfect storm that I'm going, to, I'm going to stop you there. You have this incredibly yeah. compelling, incredibly compelling real life story to tell. Yeah. Why, why didn't you decide to go back to the memoir format? Why did you decide to, to turn it into a work of fiction? You know, for a while I played around with that and I'd sort of done this first book as a memoir and um, there's sort of pluses and minuses to it, but I didn't really want to, to pursue it as, as a journalist, as an investigator or a detective. I mean, I felt like that, you know, if I did that, I could almost like reduce it to four pages. I really wanted to get into the mindset of all these characters that were part of the story, particularly my mother. Um, I had shown the, an early, early draft of, of the book to a, an edit, uh, agent friend. And he said, well, it's very curious you know, the whole book is about your mother, yet, you know, people talk about her, but she's not a character in it, you, you know, and, and he said two things. He goes, so it's a big emotional, it's almost like the heart of the book is missing, but also so many readers today, he goes, the only people who buy books are women, and you have to have a great female character in this book. Now, you know, that is and isn't true. There's, you know, there's a little grain of truth in that. But what it did, and it, it seized me immediately, was that, and maybe I just read The Lovely Bones, I don't know, the Alice Siebold book. I thought, oh my I did, God. I, I, did have, make, I, did get, I did get that connection. I can make my mother, you know, a dead woman who is sort of narrating this from heaven, or, or certainly you, you hear her thoughts. And I remember my, my friend, the, the um, agent Mitch left, I immediately went to, went to my computer and sort of typed up the first page with, uh, of the mother sort of awakening in this limbo state. And so proud of it. And to, the de to this day, that exists almost in exactly the same form I first wrote it, mm -hmm. but with one crucial difference. I wrote it in third person. I wrote it like, oh, she wakes up. She begins to, to feel this current of cloud passing by her. And um, I read it to my husband, and I don't, we are not a, a couple who shares those kinds of things. I'm not like taking every draft of my stuff to him and said, oh, read this, what do you think? But on that rare moment, I did, because I'm so proud of it. And he said, it's great, but like, just think about what if you did it in first person? What if you put it from her point of view? Like, oh, I'm waking up. Oh my God, I didn't know these feelings were possible. It brings the reader in so much more immediately and so much more quickly and gives it a, an emotional resonance. So that was the big change I made. And so to create yeah. this mother character and these sort of alternating chapters between the little boy and the mother was really when the book began to take off. Oh, that definitely gives it a shape to it. Um, but you also provide POV from some of these other characters, including characters who would, in a traditional, you know, thriller mystery book, be considered the villains. We have the the de L.E., the philandering, possibly murderous dad. We have yes. Rita, who's the other woman who's going to be, uh, there's the stepmother of these kids. Yeah. Um, it's almost like um, we're these characters that we're primed to hate because of their narrative roles, you give them these humanizing touches and these notes of regret. Um, there's a yeah. generosity there, and I'm wondering where that, where that comes from. Um, it came from Chris Cuomo um, and his big muscles is where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. <laughs> well, that got your attention, didn't it? <laughs> and I'll tell you what I mean, is Chris used to be one of the anchors at 2020. Yeah, before he, he decamped for CNN. And he was a big fan of my first book. He was a big fan of History of Swimming and would say things like, man, why don't you write like that for me every week in this copy I would have to write to him, write for him. And, you know, we were chatty and I, was, I started this new book back then and we were talking about it. And, and I'll tell you what I mean. You know, so this, the title now is Rules for Being Dead. The original title, which is perhaps one of the worst titles ever conceived was the movies we watched, parentheses, 
the year my father killed my mother. So not a lot of artistry to it. <laughs> and in Chris Cuomo's words, not a lot of grace to it. Uh, you know, and he's, he's big on grace and Catholicism. And, and point two, I realized if I did that, I gave away, you know, a huge plot element, you know, in the title. Yeah. You don't yeah. have to open it. So I really did, you know, I mean, I'm, it's kind of a fun, jokey thing to say, but I think I really have been working on this book in one form or another for about 15 years, mm. you know, so, you know, I've gone through all sorts of hills and valleys in terms of my relationship to my family and my parents. And I think, you know, as I've gotten older and I understand how hard it is to be an adult, how hard it is to be in a relationship, how hard it is to just get from day to day, I, I, I finally, you know, I gave my parents a break. You know, I am them now, you know, I am. Yeah, the is, that, is that a function of being older, of being just of having perspective on? I think it's all of those things, you know, yeah. and just, I wanna like make the, the most three dimensional characters I could and not have them be, you know, cardboard cutouts mm -hmm. um, or, or, you know, cookie cutters. And when I really committed to this idea of having a few, you know, multiple points of view, not a lot, you know, I mean, there may be six, um, and just telling their stories. These, these are my family. You know, the, my father's name was L.E. My yeah. stepmother's name was Rita. You yeah. know, my mother's bizarre kind of Southern name was Criola. And it was a little bit bratty of me to use them, but I wanted... It was almost like goading me at the same time to create their reality and to give them their their dignity and to write how how hard my father worked to provide for us. He had this, you know, only old people will understand this, but his great dream in life was to build a, a, a ranch house that was the replica of the Ponderosa from Bonanza. From Bonanza, oh. Okay, now we gotta bring, we gotta bring in movies here. You, you, you talked about the movies there. The movies are very much the, yeah. the, the, a thread in this book. This, it's a very rich 1960s harvest. We have everything from Alfie to Torn Curtain to One Million Years BC. <laughs> Which um, is a, a seminal work in my Yes, yes seminal, yes, seminal in every way, seminal in every way. Um, so Fireball 500, which is a movie I've never even heard of. Is that oh a Frankie and Ed? It's Frank an Ed and Frankie, how could you miss this? Uh, well, I did, I did. But, but what I'm struck by first, what I'm struck by though is, first of all, how, how many movies there were to see when you were a kid? How many theaters did McKinney, Texas even have? What was- McKinney, Texas had one movie theater, which was called The Ritz. Yeah. And even at 10 years old, I was like savvy enough to call it The Rats because there probably <laughs> were rats running around in it. It was so decrepit. But I, re I literally went, my twin brother and I went to see the movies every Saturday afternoon. And it was sort of, uh, my father's way of babysitting us, especially after my mother died, and he would just park us in the movie theater. And it was you know, very the, common in those days. Yeah, yeah. The ticket taker lady, as I called her, kind of knew us, and she would let us in on like adult movies like Alfie or Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, you know, things I should not be seeing, as well as you know, Bambi and Beach Blanket Bingo. So I saw everything that was there, and my mother had loved movies. So it was something, it was a way to kind of continue that connection. And in fact, in the, the earliest version of the book, where it was still floating in this kind of memoirish territory, the whole thing was written from the point of view of Clark, the little boy, but I had very um, conscientiously gone back to this little town, this little town McKinney, which is not a little town anymore. It's now a huge suburb of Dallas, population about 100,000 but I had gone to the local library and had Xeroxed the movie ads from every movie that played in those years, 66 and 67. And I had written out every single memory I had connected to those movies. Oh, wow. And it, and I, and it meant a lot to me that they were in very precise order, that I couldn't, you know, dramatically mix and match these things. Um, so, so I, I have a question for you. Do you think yeah. there is a way, a specific way that a gay child reacts to movies that a, a straight child does not? 
do you know what? It's weird because I wanted I, this vague idea. I think of wanting to be a, a movie star. Uh, I love the glamour of it, but even more than like movies that were in a literal, literally glamorous setting. I love, I think, and this is the, the gay element. I love the escape of them. Mm -hmm. I had this ability to sort of put myself inside the movie as a way a, away from the town, the home, the house, the landscape I was living in. So I could literally, it was a way to go live inside the movie. Uh, and if it was, if it, I was on a like a car on an old country road, that was an escape for me. So it was a little bit escaping that land, but it was also, you know, like like you know, seeing you know Frankie Avalon in his in his bathing suit. Um, and, and and of course, this brings us to Robert Conrad, which is the thing we most wanted to talk about. No, uh, I want everybody. Speaking of seminal experiences, yes, we to raise the their hands if they know who Robert Conrad <laughs> is or was. Yeah. Um, I, I knew him from a show, a show called The Wild Wild West, which was, uh, uh, yes. in, 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 in retrospect, a kind of, yeah, a major life passage for me. And I remember look, just staring at him and, and explaining it to myself, well, it's just because he's so well-dressed, it's just because this is the... Yeah, so well dressed. I, I was, I he was, had cowboy clothes that often were ripped off him. <laughs> he was tied up and tortured. Yeah, oh. no, it was, and he and Artie had this kind of interesting domestic partnership, right? Where they went, they yeah. went, they traveled in the train, and they lived. To, you know, they they went, they went home together. You know, Jim may yeah. have some some femme fatale who was trying to seduce him, but he always went home with Artie. So I think that yeah. was that was what I absorbed from. Robert. Well, and the other thing, I, I had written an essay for The Advocate that came out about a month ago called Tarzan Made Me Gay. And I certainly <laughs> also went to all the- Which old, one? Well, so very specifically, Mike Henry. And yeah. Mike Henry was this football player yeah, that they discovered yeah. and sort of, you know, turned into an actor. And he was in all of three Tarzan movies- I remember. Uh, that appeared during 1966 and 67. So seeing Mike Henry up on the, the big screen, uh, you know, the Ritz was also a very, a very seminal moment as well. But I was, yeah. you know, I was, I was a little gay boy who didn't know I was a little gay boy, yeah. uh, you know, watching these movies. And the interesting thing about this was, you know, the, in, in history of swimming, there's, there's no doubt I'm, I'm a, it's a memoir on, on me and Kim Powers in this relationship with my boyfriend then, now husband. Um, you know, it's gay, gay, gay. In this book, he's a little 10 year old boy and there's only, there are only one or two little elements sort of like this kind of crush he sort of begins to have on, on the, the high school boy who runs the, um, the projector in the projection booth. But there's nothing explicitly gay or sexual in any way about it. And yet it feels like my, my gayest book which is saying something because all my yeah. books are really gay. <laughs> but there's this, this sensitivity to him and this heartbreak he has and this profound connection to his mother that are so, um, I, I don't want to like put him in a, a pigeonhole him and say, are such signifiers or, or check marks, but they just are. I mean, you, you cannot read this book and walk away with any other thought about who this little kid is and who yeah. he's going to turn out to be, I think, you know? Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I, I do want to, I, I think now I'm going to flip it back to Wiley because I think there are questions that want, that need to be answered. Um, Wiley, is this, was, is this a good time? That's perfect. Yeah. That was like listening to y'all at five o'clock in the afternoon sitting in a corner of the bar. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's what y'all were doing, but that was fantastic. Um, and I think it speaks, you know, y'all acknowledging, and we talked about this yesterday, but at the top of this, y'all acknowledging author friendships that we don't see each other that much. Right. But like, I've never met either of you in person, but I know when I meet you in person, we're going to immediately like, let's go have dinner. Let's go yeah, have a drink. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's go, yeah. Absolutely. Let's go recount this experience. So it's just, it's just a, for, for the folks who are watching, it's just, um, it's just a warming, it's a community thing. And you know, we're, we're zooming and we're distant, but it still feels, it feels good and, 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 and nice. But, but Kim, I have a question and, and, and I want to encourage folks, if folks do have questions, we don't have a ton of time left, 
Um, so, so enter your questions in the chat box. There's been more comments than questions. Like, <laughs> this is incredible. I'm enjoying this. That's a great story. What a storyteller. So people are beginning to ask questions. But I, I, he's gay? Wait, he's gay? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have a question for you, Kim. What was it like spiritually? You know, you said this is your least gay book, but it's your gayest book. And I'm wondering if that was because spiritually you got to go back and reimagine life and kind of limb out your own experience. What was the spiritual or metaphysical or emotional exercise of that? What was the toll of that on your writing? Do you know, it's so interesting because I, I, I feel like it's the book that finally set me free. You know, I had written in this, um, you know, history of swimming book, you know, I, there's been a lot of my death, death in my family is about the death of my twin brother. And some people said when I wrote it, was it cathartic to finally let go of all that? And I have to say it wasn't. I mean, it, and to some degree, it was an exercise in masochism just to, to make myself dwell in the grief of that and to not let myself ever forget or ever escape. And there are lesser degrees of that in the two intervening books, even though those were complete fiction, um, you know, made up. With this one, I mean, and again, I just, I keep going back to, and maybe it's all of us, you know, living through this COVID world and sort of being in isolation and aware of mortality. Although those were certainly not the elements, you know, for all the years I wrote this. Somehow there's a, by the time I got to it, there was a sense that I had survived and, and I would have made my parents proud. You know, I even, you know, I can't escape the Southern Baptist world. And I even wonder, oh, what are they thinking about it, reading it in heaven? Are they mad I've revealed these secrets? Are they proud of me for it? Uh, you know, are they proud that their names are in a book finally? And I think they are, because I think, I think, I hope to give them their full dimensionality. And I have to say, it, number one, it's exhausted all the family stories. You will never see another book of mine about the family skeletons. But there is a profound sense of, of spirituality. And maybe it's because all, all my books, you know, end with, um, you know, in this one, it almost breaks my heart to even say, the, you know, the mother character, Criola, has the last chapter. And she says something like, and I will be here waiting for them. When oh, they it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful ending. It's a beautiful ending. to heaven. And that's sort of how I feel about the book. It is, it is about this family reuniting, you know, after death. Mm -hmm. Well, what a testament that you're able to do that in a book, you know, reunite them in a way that, that they weren't able to be united in, yeah. in life, perhaps. We do have, we do have some questions. Um, Karen uh, asks, who do you have read your manuscripts? You mentioned reading, reading something to your husband. And I feel like spouses who are people, our partners who are with us a lot do have a way of getting at the thing faster than we can often get at the thing. Um, but how do you know a book's done? How do you know you're ready to let it go? Do you know what I am? And, and maybe this is, means I'm not very popular. I have never been in a, in a reading or writing group. Uh, you know, I don't have people who've read stuff of mine. I've always, I guess in a way, been too humble to ask a big commitment of a person because it's a lot to read a book. And um, I think along the way with this one, I had maybe hired two uh, freelance editors. So it felt like a little bit more like a legitimate um, process, you know, and, and not just like, oh, it's great, I loved it, but like, I need constructive work on it. But I want to do a, a shout out to, I've had the, both, the best publishing experience of my life working with Blair Publishing and uh, with Lynn York and Robin Mura, my editor. And even though there wasn't radical work on the book, I feel like in the most subtle way, they shaped, they shaped what needed to be shaped. And, and just gave this final polish on the book so that their very careful, careful reading is what counted in the long run to, to, to make this the perfect book for me. Yeah, and, and, and speaking of them, people are, are giving them shout outs right here. I've worked with, uh, with, uh, with Blair as well, and I feel like it's these small presses now, you know, to move a big house is like trying to steer a battleship. Yeah. Small presses, are swift and they they return phone calls and you, you have their phone numbers you can text them and 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 the responsiveness is fantastic um so you you released a book in the middle of a pandemic 
Are you working on one now? That's another question. Somebody. <laughs> I am sort of always, always sort of working on something crazy, you know, I feel like I, I, I can't write anything else that takes a pound of flesh, you know, as, as fleshy as I've gotten eating during the pandemic, I don't have a lot to spare. So I, I'm sort of juggling like three different things that are all, all very silly, not silly, but they're fun. I'll, and I'll, I'll tease you with two ideas. I mean, two titles. One is called Handbells for Jesus which is uh, about my uh, my youth in the Southern Baptist Church. And the other is called Make a Duty for Daddy, which is a book about my husband and our little dog, Frankie, and um, always checking in on her bowel movements every day, <laughs> <laughs> which any dog owner can appreciate. <laughs> when I hear handbells for Jesus, I also was raised Southern Baptist. I immediately do this. I was in the handbell choir. Oh, I yeah. I played the lowest notes because they were the ones that rang the fewest times in any song. And I couldn't read music, but I could like do the big chime at the end for like the final, you know, sort of nail in the coffin. And you had to wear your, your white gloves. And I was on a trip for two weeks with this youth choir, schlepping those thousand pound bells through the jungles of Puerto Rico. Oh, that's great. Um, anyway, that's what that's about. Well, I think we're, we're out of time. That went, that, that fly on the wall bar conversation uh, kind of sped by, but y'all have been fantastic. So, so if you enjoyed tonight's, con this afternoon's conversation, please purchase Kim's book uh, or, or, or Lou's books from the independent end bookstore that invited you here tonight. And Courting I want to thank his newest paperback out in paperback now. <laughs> Courting Mr. Lincoln now out in paperback. And that book got a lot of attention as thank well. You. So thank you. Thank I you. I want to thank Kim Powers and I want to thank Lewis Byard for, for joining us tonight. And just a this reminder, Thursday evening at 7 p.m., we're going to be here with Sarah Broom, author of The Yellow House. It won a National Book Award. Um, so please, that'll be a special event. She'll be in conversation. So the bookstore that invited you tonight, make sure they invite you. Make sure you go to their website and you register for Thursday night's event. Check the calendars. We're doing these into November, and then hopefully after the holidays, we'll begin doing them again. So my name's Wiley Cash. I'm a writer living here in North Carolina, weathering hurricanes and pandemics and uh, a four-year-old and a five-year-old. So be safe. Uh, support your local independent bookstore and have a great night. Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, Wiley. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.